Let's open our Bibles together to the book of Job. We're going to be looking tonight at chapters 7 and 8. Chapters 7 and 8 as we continue our series here in the book of Job. I'd welcome you who are watching us online. I'm expecting some of you are. Others are watching the Dodger game. It's good to have you with us. Uh, A couple of announcements, and uh, we'll get into our study. And I'll just read what has been given to me. Um, Next week, we're going to be having on Wednesday night uh, a kids' ministry event. And uh, kids in pre-K through 6th grade will have a special in-class event on Wednesday the 28th. And it's called Unmasked. It's a, a dark world, so be the light. And it's intended to help them to understand and understand that being the light is far better than celebrating the dark. So the kids will be encouraged to look behind the masks that people wear every day, even here in church, and uh, learn the importance of looking at the hearts of others instead of looking at their outward appearances. There's going to be a time of special teaching, crafts, and a snack. And kids are welcome to dress up, but no scary costumes. And uh, if you'd like to bring some candy... Uh, It's being accepted, donations are being accepted in the kids' ministry office, and you can drop off donations after services or Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Also, tomorrow, uh, we're going to have an outdoor fall festival for you ladies. Uh, It's from 5.30 to 7.30. There's outdoor shopping. Forty local vendors will be here, a gourmet food truck. And the cafe and the chapel store will be open at 7.30. Uh, There's going to be worship. My wife, Marie, is going to share with the ladies. It's a free event. No registration required. Men, we do have our men's breakfast. It's Saturday, November 7th at 8.30. We're going to have Brennan Beeler with us. Tickets are available. You can purchase your tickets online through the church's website or at the gazebo. It's a good opportunity to come and invite somebody. Tuesday morning men's uh, study every Tuesday. It's growing. That's a blessing to see that. Every Tuesday morning at 6.30 in the chapel, there's a time of fellowship, and we're calling it Bible Brothers and Burritos, and so that's a good thing. Uh, The Young Adults Bible Study meets every Monday at 7.30 p.m. in the banquet hall. Our Shore Foundation classes have resumed after being closed due to the COVID restrictions these classes provide believers with tools to help them mature in their faith. It's, in, uh, it's on Tuesday or Thursday evenings at 7 o'clock in room 405. And again, tamale pre-order sales have already begun. All sales are online. First day of pickup is Sunday, November 1st at what we're calling the tamale tent in the courtyard. Don't forget to pre-order your tamales at least one week in advance. And thank you, because this all goes to supporting our children, our youth ministry. Okay, with that said, we're going to be looking today at Job chapter um, 7 and 8. And so we'll begin by looking at verses 1 through, uh, 1 through 10 in chapter 7, and we'll get into our study. Job chapter uh, 7, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 10. Is there not a time of hard service for man on earth? Are not his days also like the days of a hired man, like a servant who earnestly desires the shade, and like a hired man who eagerly looks for his wages? So I have been allotted months of futility, and wearisome nights have been appointed to me. When I lie down, I say, when shall I arise and the night be ended? For I have had my fill of tossing till dawn. My flesh is caked with worms and dust. My skin is cracked and breaks out afresh. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. Oh, remember that my life is a breath. My eye will never never again see good. The eye of him who sees me will see me no more. While your eyes are upon me, I shall no longer be. As the clouds disappears, as the cloud disappears and vanishes away, So he who goes down to the grave does not come up. He shall never return to his house, nor shall his place know him anymore. Beautiful, upbeat words that we get a chance to look at. Let me remind you of a few things that we've already seen in chapter 6. In chapter 6, Job had finished expressing what he would call a deep anguish of the soul. 
And he had stated to his so-called comforters, if, if you could only weigh the sorrow of my heart, you'd understand my pain. But your counsel is tasteless. I therefore refuse to listen to what you've been saying. Instead, I would prefer death to living. I wish that God would crush me in my misery. I have lost everything. I've lost my former prosperity. I'm frail, and I can't take this pain and sorrow. If you truly loved me, he was saying to them, you would comfort me instead of further hurting me. Instead, you try to correct me and do not succeed in showing me where I have erred. Remember in verses 29 and 30 of chapter 6, he had, he had closed by saying, Yield now, let there be no injustice. Concede my righteousness still stands. Is there injustice on my tongue? Cannot my taste discern the unsavory? So he's already closed by saying, Your counsel does not help me. And so what we have here in chapter 7, and let me give you a bit of an outline for just a moment, is the continuation of his defense. Verses 1 through 10 gives us his belief that he has a right to complain. Verse 11 makes it clear that he believes he has an unlimited right to complain. And verses 12 through 21, he takes his complaint directly to God. We're going to see that as this chapter unfolds before us. So as we look at chapter 7, in verses 1 through 5, I'll take them as a group and then move on. He begins with a question. He says, is there not, in verse 1, is there not a time of hard service for man on earth? Are not his days also like the days of a hired man? So he speaks concerning a time of hard service. If you take notes, the words hard service are words that are used, that usually speak of war or warfare. Hard service speaks of military service. It speaks about going out to war. So he's saying, does man not have a lifetime of hard service? Does man not endure a lifetime of warfare? Is what he's saying there. Of warfare. What kind of warfare might he be speaking about? Well, in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 8, Solomon said, There is no man who has power over the spirit to retain the spirit, Neither has he power in the day of death. There is no discharge in that war. Neither shall wickedness deliver those who are given to it. We have a war we're fighting. We ultimately are going to die. And that's the point that Job is making. Does man not have a lifetime of hard service, of warfare? Is there not a war every day going on? And is it not a, a, a life that's going to end up ultimately, ultimately dying? Like a servant, verse 2, who earnestly desires the shade. Like a hired man who eagerly looks for his wages. Servants and hired employees work hard. And at night, they find time to rest. Why am I not being given a time to rest from all the pain that I'm experiencing? He says in verse 3, I have been allotted months of futility. Wearsome nights have been appointed to me. When I lie down, I say, when shall I arise? And the night be ended. For I have had my fill of tossing till dawn. I'm unable to serve the Lord. My days are hard. I'm frustrated. I'm tired. My nights are especially difficult. They're long and they're painful. My son David, just yesterday, went and had an operation on his shoulder. And I was speaking to him today. And I asked him, how are you doing? He had had some nerve damage and other things that they were repairing. And he said something to me that is, it, 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 it basically mirrors what, what Job is saying. He said, I was in such pain that I could hardly sleep. And that's what Job is speaking about here. He's speaking about lying down. And it says in verse 4 again, notice, when I lie down, I say, when shall I arise? And then I be ended. Have you ever spent a night tossing and turning in pain? Many people have. I have. You know, you, you just, you're in pain. You have physical problems or whatever, and, and you just cannot rest. And he's been going through this for months, not just for a day, not just for a week, but for months, months he's been suffering in this. And he's saying, listen, I'm just tired. I, I'm, I'm unable to serve the Lord because my body doesn't allow me to do that. And the days that I'm living in right now, all day long, it's hard. It's, 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 it's difficult for me. I'm frustrated. But when I go to bed, it's especially difficult because my nights are long. I've, I've spent long nights where, where you just wish you could go to sleep and you can't. And the pain is there and it keeps you awake. 
One of the things that he's saying in this, though, it made me think, and I'll just say it quickly, what he's saying is understandable. But when you feel that you're not being of any service, when you're feeling that your nights are just wearisome, like he says, you know, you can use your nights for, for, for things, and, and not everybody would consider this immediately, but it is something you can do, and it is something I've done. And it's something I counseled my mom about. My mom had a lot of physical pain, especially in the last year of her life. But mom had a lot of physical pain. She had lupus and various other things she dealt with. And, and on one occasion, I still remember having a conversation with her where she, she had said to me similar, similar thoughts that Job is communicating. She said, you know, uh, at night I just toss and turn. I'm in a lot of pain. I can't sleep. I can't rest. And she says, you know, son, I... I, I, I feel so useless. I feel like I, I have, what's my purpose? And I remember having this conversation where I said to her, and I didn't take her pain lightly, by the way. I didn't minimize it. It was very real. But I said, you know, Mama, uh, one of the things that you might want to think about is this. And my mom was a prayer warrior. She was a prayer warrior. I said, Mama, what you need to do is you need to pray, not just for yourself, obviously. But I said, lift your, lift your prayers to the Lord. You're awake, and you're not useless. You may not be able to get out of your bed and do the things that you'd like to do. You can't go and visit with people. You can't share your faith with those that you used to share with. When she'd go to a store or go to even to the doctors, she would share her faith with people. You can't do that anymore right now. But, Mom, you can pray. You're not useless. You can redeem the time. You just have to find opportunity to do it. And Job right now is saying, I feel like I, I have no opportunities. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm dying. I have no place of rest. I feel fatigued. And, and uh, verse 4 is making it clear. That the pain is greatest at night. But I'm, I, I can't sleep. I, I toss and I, I turn in pain. In verse 5 he says, my flesh is caked with worms and dust. My skin is cracked and breaks out afresh. My, my flesh is filled with, well, like maggots, if you will. Sores that he refers to as lumps of dust. My skin is dry and it's, it, it breaks and, and new if infections are erupting. In verse 6, my days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle are spent without hope. My days are short and few. My life will soon come to its end. I have no hope to ever recover. Verse 7, oh, remember that my life is a breath. My eye will never again see good. So Job seems to be turning his cry to the Lord now and asking, God, listen to me. Uh, I, 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 my days are few. It, it's like what it says in Psalm 102, uh, verse 11, where it reads, my days are like the evening shadow. I wither away like grass. You know, when you're young, you feel that time goes by so slowly. As you grow older, you begin to think that time goes by very quickly. And with Job, he's saying, these things that I'm going through make me realize that, that, that my days are few and they're going by swiftly. Well, that knowledge, that knowledge that your life is short is intended to, to cause us to seek the Lord. Well, we can. Ecclesiastes 12, 1 says it like this. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when you shall say, I have no pleasure in them. Remember now the creator in the days of your youth. Because your days do pass by quickly. In verse 8, he says, The eye of him who sees me will see me no more. While your eyes are upon me, I shall no longer be. I'm about to die, and you will not see me face to face on earth ever again. Verse 9, As the cloud disappears and vanishes away, so he who goes down to the grave does not come up. As a cloud is consumed by the heat of the sun and then vanishes, he's saying, I too will soon vanish. 
James in chapter 4 verse 14 said it like this. He said, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? He went on to say, it's a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. So the cloud disappears and vanishes away, and so is my life. In verse 10, he shall never return to his house, nor shall his place know him anymore. While alive, I could go to work and then come home from work. But when a person dies, he doesn't come home any anymore, not in the way he used to. And so as he's saying that, he goes, I have a right to complain. Verse 11, therefore, I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit because I believe this to be true I have a right to unlimited complaining since I'm hurting I have a right to cry out don't try to stop me I need to share with God how I'm hurting I need to ease myself by crying out you know as I've been saying as we go through the book of Job I'll probably repeat this thought several times through the book but one of, the, one of the things that I think is necessary, and Job is actually saying this right now, is not so much that I have a right to complain, but that in my complaint, it's actually sometimes actually expressing a faith that I have to the Lord because I'm speaking to the one who can relieve the pain that I'm in. And I think that, that sometimes it's, it's important for us to, to allow people to speak what's on their heart, regardless of whether you agree with it. Regardless of whether you think that, that they're showing a lack of faith, one of the things I see in, in Christians is sometimes, and it's a sad thing to admit to, but it's true, is that many Christians in my lifetime, at least that I've seen, um, don't know how to weep with those who weep. They just don't. You know, maybe there's an uncomfortableness that comes when you see somebody hurting and you just want to give them a word of encouragement to help them feel better. I don't know. But I learned a long time ago that sometimes I just need to let that person complain. It's not that I agree with them. I may disagree complete, completely with them. But sometimes I need to allow them to do that so that they come to the end of that. And then now we can have a conversation about that. Now we can speak concerning the things they're going through. And, and I think that's very important. And in the case of Job, he's saying, listen, I, I'm in a, a lot of pain and, and I, I, I want to make my voice heard. And I'm not going to restrain my mouth. I'm going to speak of the anguish of my soul. And uh, his friends are trying to correct him. You're going to see this in just a moment. But I, I'm hurting, and, and I have a right to cry. And he goes on in verse 12. He says, am I, am I a sea or a sea serpent that you, speaking to God, that you set a guard over me? Am I a sea? Am I without a mind? Am I wild and out of control so you can't communicate with me? He says, you have set a guard over me. I feel like you have enclosed me. You have shut me in. You've suffocated me, and you've suffocated my cries. And that's how I'm feeling, Lord. In verse 13, when I say my bed will comfort me, my couch will ease my complaint, then you scare me with dreams and terrify me with visions. I'm having nightmares. I can't rest. I'm in so much pain, I can't sleep. One commentator pointed out that most likely Satan had been permitted to frighten him as he slept. And these frightening dreams and all that he was having actually took his peace away from him and took away his rest. In verse 15 he says, My soul chooses strangling and death rather than my body. That's a pretty strong statement. I would prefer a violent death if it's quick rather than my flesh being slowly consumed. It's a picture of him now, just skin and bones. In verse 16, I loathe my life. I would not live forever. Let me alone. For my days are but a breath. I can't take this anymore. I want it to end. I want to die. Please let me die. You are the God who determines length of life. So withdraw your hand from me. I'm asking you, let me die. Verse 17, what is man that you should exalt him, that you should set your heart on him, that you should visit him every morning and test him every moment? Why are you paying attention to me? Why are you paying attention to men? 
Why are you making man such a subject of trials? How long? How long will you not look away from me and let me alone till I swallow my saliva? How long am I going to suffer? When he says, till I swallow my saliva, that speaks of being taken in a headlock until you can't breathe. Have I sinned? What have I done to you, O watcher of men? Why have you set me as your target so that I'm a burden to myself? Have you ever spoken to the Lord like that? Have you ever said, God, it feels like you've set me up and you're firing your arrows at me? This is a very poetic way of saying, Lord, why am I being treated this way? You're correcting me, but you haven't shown me where I've, where I've done wrong. What have I done? How can I make it right? I, I'm weary. I can't endure this any longer. Why, why have you chosen me to vent your anger on? He says in verse 21, Why then do you not pardon my transgression? Take away my iniquity. For now I will lie down in the dust, and you will seek me diligently, but I will no longer be. God, pardon my transgression. You're a God filled with mercy. Why have you not forgiven me if I've sinned? Now I will lie down in the dust. He says, you will seek me diligently. It's too late. I'm going to die. And though you seek me to pardon me, I'm going to be dead. And that's why I need your help now. So he's poured out his soul and he's speaking in front of his friends. And now one of his friends begins to speak to him. Enter Bildad. And I mentioned to you again, remember this as you take your notes, Bildad, the Shuhite, is the shortest man in the Old Testament. Anyway, I'll wait for that one. Okay. Then Bildad, the Shuhite, answered and said, How long will you speak these things, and the words of your mouth be like strong wind? Does God subvert judgment, or does the Almighty pervert justice? If your sons have sinned against him, he has cast them away for their transgression. If you would earnestly seek God and make your supplication to the Almighty, if you were pure and upright, surely now he would awake for you and prosper your rightful dwelling place. Though your beginning was small, yet your latter end would increase abundantly. Build that. Let's look at him for just a moment. One commentator wanted to point out that Bildad apparently was younger than Aliphaz, but he would be older than the third counselor, Zophar. So it would be speaking in uh, chronological sequence, the older, then the next oldest, and then the youngest. So apparently he's younger than Aliphaz, but older than Zophar. This is a man, as we look at him, who is an example of a person who speaks first, but doesn't listen with the heart. If you want a good scripture, Proverbs 18, 13 is a good one here. It says, he who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. And Bildad is one of those guys who's just waiting for your mouth to stop so his mouth can begin. He's one of those guys who's ready to give advice, and he's been waiting, and uh, as, as Aliphaz has been speaking, and then Job has responded, we have this man, Bildad, who has been waiting, and now he has his opportunity to speak, and that's what he's doing. But again, he's an example of somebody who speaks first without thinking. And so in verse 2, when he says, how long will you speak these things in the words of your mouth, he says, uh, be like a strong wind. He's, he's simply saying, um, I want to repeat some of the things that you've already heard, but I'm going to be more direct. And notice how he opens. He opens with a rebuke. How long will you speak these things? In other words, we've sat patiently with you, but you continue to spout off. So you need to be silenced. Now, in Job chapter 6, verse 14, Job had made a plea. He had said to him who is afflicted, Kindness should be shown by his friend. But what he's doing is showing anything but kindness. He actually says your words are like a strong wind. It, it scatters everything around it. Your, your, your words are like a strong wind. It's so loud, it drowns out all the people's voices. 
In other words, you're just making a lot of noise. And now he begins to give his, his comments. Verse 3, he says, does God subvert judgment? Does the Almighty pervert justice? In other words, does God judge unrighteously? Does he afflict people unjustly? Does he punish those who are good? And what he's saying here is, is Job, God obviously is judging you. Listen, if you weren't in sin, you wouldn't be under his judgment because God is perfect. And God doesn't make mistakes, and therefore, you're only reaping the consequences of what you have done. You've implied that God is unjust, he's saying, and God is not unjust. And then he goes and gets even more personal when he says in verse 4, if your sons have sinned against him, he has cast them away for their transgression. He killed your children. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine him saying that? Because his children died, remember? When the wind came and knocked down the house and his seven sons and three daughters died, he's saying, Job, you're the reason your children died. I remember a, a teacher, quote-unquote, a false teacher, who was on television and was sharing how that a woman had had a miscarriage and he was, quote-unquote, ministering to the woman who had lost her baby and had said to her, if you had faith, you wouldn't have lost your baby. And I remember hearing him. It was on TV, and millions were listening to this guy say, you were the reason your, your baby died. You were the reason. What kind of cruelty is that? What kind, of, what kind of word is that? And that's what Bildad is giving right now. You're saying God is unjust. God is not unjust, Job. Your children died because they should have. And you're getting what you deserve. Remember Aliphaz had said in chapter 5 verse 4 that uh, his sons are far from safety. They're crushed in the gate. So Bildad is simply adding to what has already been said. If you're in sin, your children have no place of safety. Your children, he is saying, have died because of you. Now Aliphaz and now Bildad believe that, that they... Know what only God would know. You see, God is the only one who searches out our hearts, and yet they're making judgments of, of, of Job's heart. In, in Hebrews 4.13, it says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. God is the only one who knows everything. He sees it all. In Proverbs 17, verse 3, it says, The refining pot is for silver, and the furnace is for gold. But the Lord tries the hearts. In Jeremiah 17, verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. God is the one who searches the heart, but Aliphaz and Bildad believe that they know what only God himself would know. If your sons have sinned against him, he has cast, away, cast them away for their transgression. Verse 5 if you would earnestly seek God and make your supplication to the Almighty, if you were pure and upright, surely now he would awake for you and prosper your rightful dwelling place. So my solution is <laughs> seek God. Confess your sin. If you do, he'll pardon you abundantly. He'll restore your prosperity. You see the underlying message here? You have no faith because if you did, you wouldn't have these problems. He says in verse 7, though your beginning was small, yet your latter end would increase abundantly. When God rebuilds you after confessing your sin, he's going to bless you once again. Now, if Job had been going through this because of sin, this, this would have been correct. You see, Proverbs 28, 13 says, he who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. If he actually had been in sin, well, that would have been a true statement. But the fact is, as we know that at the beginning of the book, God said that this was a righteous man. And the enemy was trying to cause Job to curse God. And that was the whole purpose of all that's taking place. What you have here is you have a man correcting a man for sinning when the man, in fact, hadn't brought this on because of sin. So he's saying... If you cover your sin, you're not going to prosper. Well, 
again, in a sense, there's truth to that. I remember uh, King David, how King David said in Psalm 32, verses 3 through 5, when I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you. My iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I'll confess my transgressions to the Lord. You forgave the iniquity of my sin. If Job had sinned, well, of course, it's important to confess and forsake. And God is merciful, and God does forgive. God does restore. Those things are right. But the problem is Bildad is accusing Job of something he hasn't done. There may be a hint of sarcasm here, by the way. He, he would be saying that if Job were innocent, he wouldn't be undergoing this pain. So confess your sin. It'll all go away. Once again, you will be blessed. Verse 8, inquire, please, of the former age. Consider the things discovered by their fathers. Put my advice to the test. Do research. Search out the ancient writings and the ancient teachings. Did not all the sages of ancient history verify my words? You see, ancient wisdom agrees with me. The wicked can flourish, that's true, but they only flourish temporarily. And the ancients discovered that the righteous endure affliction, but when evil is repented of, they are restored. And so he's saying, all you need to do is look into the past and see what has taken place. Inquire, he says, of the former age. Consider the things discovered by their fathers. Verse 9, for we were born yesterday and know nothing because our days on earth are a shadow. We're young. We are inexperienced. We have little knowledge of the ways of the world. We're, 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 we're still growing in our experience in life. And so the ancients lived longer and they discovered great truths that they've communicated to me. Now, you need to remember that when he speaks of the ancients, he's speaking of those who were from the early days, like in Adam and, and those early days. And when you read in the book of Genesis, the ages of these people, they lived for hundreds of years, over 900 years, some of them. And so in 900 years, I guess you're going to gain a lot of knowledge and experience. It's interesting, it's almost, it, it, it can be looked at as in an interesting way. If you think of Genesis chapter 47, verse 9, when Jacob was standing before the Pharaoh of Egypt, and he was speaking to the Pharaoh, and he said, the years of my pilgrimage are 130. My years have been few and difficult, and they do not equal the years of the pilgrimage of my fathers. I'm 130 years old, but I'm a kid compared to them. So I feel like a teenager about right now. You know, the longer you live, the, the more experiences you gain. Now, that doesn't mean that the longer you live, the wiser you get, because that's not necessarily true, because it's been said there's no fool like an old fool. If you live a long time, but you don't, you don't follow the ways of the Lord and you don't gain experience and knowledge and walk in the Spirit... Well, it's very possible to be 70, 80, 90 years old and still a foolish person. But those in ancient times who lived a long time and had a long walk with the Lord learned many things that are communicated to those who follow after them. And because in the earlier days when creation was new and, and uh, the earth had a, a greater atmosphere and it was more possible to live longer years and over time, the years of man... Uh, became less and less until the psalmist finally said a man may live 70 years, perhaps 80, for reason of strength. From the 900 plus years that the original um, human beings lived to what we have now is all because of sin and all because of uh, the environment has changed over time. But when you live a long time and you walk in the ways of the Lord, you gain a lot of experience. And when you gain a lot of experience, you're able to communicate that to others. And so Bildad is simply saying, listen, what I'm telling you is not unique to me. It's something that if you were to take some time and Google it, he wasn't saying that, but if you were to take some time and look this up, look for some sources of information, look for some of the writings, some of the things that have been presented to us that we have that, we have that, that guide us, you would see that the things I'm saying to you right now are accurate. 
The ancients would know these things. So inquire of the former age. Consider the things discovered by their fathers. For, he said again in verse 9, we were born yesterday, know nothing. Our days on earth are a shadow. Will they not teach you and tell you and utter words from their heart? Job had said, teach me and I will hold my tongue. Cause me to understand wherein I've erred. He had said that in chapter 6, verse 24. So he's responding by saying, since you want to be taught, well, do your homework. He says, they will utter words from their heart. Their words are not hasty. They come through observation. They come through reflection. Their words are sincere. And their, 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 their wisdom comes by experience. He says in verse 11, Can the pap papyrus grow up without a marsh? Can the reeds flourish without water? While it is yet green and not cut down, it withers before any other plant. The papyrus and a reed, obviously, are plants that require moisture. So it's a picture of pro the prosperity of the wicked. It, at first, they seem to flourish. And, and that's true. And I don't want to, I don't, boy, how can I say this? How? Oh. I'll say it because it's true. It's just, it's hard to say something with, when you want to say it, to say a certain thing, and it comes off in a different way. But here we go. Sometimes, please come back next week. Sometimes, <laughs> have you ever wondered how come the wicked seem to prosper? Have you ever thought that? I mean, that's a common thought in Scripture, of course. Why does, you know... I'm raising my kid in the ways of the Lord, but my kid keeps getting in trouble. And my next door neighbor has a kid the same age, and they, they pretty much ignore that child. But, but their kid is an honor roll student at school, and my kid isn't doing well at all. That kid seems to be better than my kid, and not only that, but that guy didn't lose his job. But I know that the guys, and you know, he's a drunk, and, and, and they live in a, an evil way, and yet they seem to be prospering, and I'm doing the best that I can, but I'm in danger of losing my job. Lord, how come people prosper, and those who, those who do their best to serve you seem to get the short end of the stick? How come? Have you ever thought that even once in your life? Have you ever thought, how, how, Lord, it, it's almost like not even worth doing all this and going through all of this because it seems the more I try, the worse it is. I was talking to Marie, I, my wife, and I was saying to her, there's a guy named Jeff Bezos who's the richest man. And see, again, I'm going to give you some numbers that nobody's going to understand because you can't. I'll tell you why in a minute. If you told me that you had a million dollars, I can get my mind around a million. I can get my mind around that. Why? Because houses are selling for a million dollars, so I, that's a figure I can get into. I can, oh, okay. If you tell me a billion, no, you're getting a little further because I don't know what a billion really is, and, you know, a thousand million or whatever, you know. But I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. One billion dollars, can you imagine that? Now, if you say 10 million, 15, 25, 100 million, my mind can wrap around that a bit. Jeff Bezos' uh, personal wealth is something like 165 billion dollars. Now, we were talking about this the other day, because I wrote him and said, could you tie it? No, I, I didn't. <laughs> We were talking about that the other day, and I was telling Marie, that is a figure, that is a number that I can't understand. I can't understand that number. But when you read articles on, on this man, and again, I'm not trying to be his judge, but I will say it like this. 
unfaithful to his wife, with his wife's best friend. That's common knowledge. You could read that anywhere. I'm not saying that by gossip. That's just a fact. And the guy doesn't honor the Lord at all. And it seems like on one level, he, he will never, he, I'll put it like this. He could, if this were possible, which it's not, but say it were, if he was walking down the street and he had a million dollars in a satchel and he put the satchel down and walked away and forgot, he wouldn't even miss it. He wouldn't even miss it. He wouldn't even know a million dollars. He wouldn't even, you know, why? Because I don't even know how to say $165 billion in, in, in words that make sense. Because the interest on his money that he has right now, has instantly, he's instantly made it up. He never lost it. He could go into any place and buy anything he wants and n never really even touch his, his, his money because a, a day later, he's already made it back. See, that's something I don't understand. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because I'm jealous. No, the reason <laughs> I'm bringing this up is because you see people who love the Lord... And they seem to always have a difficult time. A tough time holding a job. A tough time making a payment. A tough time. They can't even buy the kids shoes sometimes. And, and if you look around long enough, you're going to see that that seems to be common for a lot of people. A lot of people. And so we end up with a lot of, a lot of um, armchair philosophers. And Bildad is one of them. And he's saying to Job, listen, if you were really righteous, your kids wouldn't have died. So let's face it. If you were really righteous, you wouldn't be suffering the way that you are because the fact is, is you're not. And what you need to do is you need to look into the books. What I'm saying to you isn't something that I created. This is ancient wisdom. Let's look into it. We're youth. We're young. What do we know? My experience is limited. But read from those who have gone before us. And they agree with me. God is dealing with you. That's what he's saying. God is dealing with you because you're a sinner. Look at how he says in verse 13. He says, so are the paths of all who forget God. And the hope of the hypocrite shall perish. That's a strong statement. He's calling Job a hypocrite. Job, you began well, but your sin has caught up with you. He says in verse 14, whose confidence shall be cut off and whose trust is a spider's web. A spider's web, that's an interesting picture. A spider's web can be beautiful if you walk outside and you see it then in the morning sun, but it's fragile, it's destroyed quickly. So, so their confidence, their hope is in their wealth, but it's taken away suddenly. That's why Paul in 1 Timothy 6.17 says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Put your trust in God. He said, the confidence they have, these hypocrites, and Job would seem to be included in that, shall be cut off. It's like trusting in a spider's web. In verse 15, he leans on his house, but it doesn't stand he holds it fast, it doesn't endure. He grows green in the sun, his branches spread out in his garden. His roots wrap around the rock heap and look for a place in the stones. If he's destroyed from this place, it will deny him, saying, I haven't seen you. So he's emphasizing that there's no stability. There's no way that the wicked can endure. In verse 15, he leans on his house, it doesn't stand. He holds it fast. It doesn't endure. In verses 16 and 17, he grows green in the sun. The branches spread out in his garden. In other words, the wicked can prosper temporarily. It can appear that they'll always flourish, but they don't. Because in verse 18, if he's destroyed from his place, then it will deny him, saying, I haven't seen you. This is another way of saying, I, I never knew you. So these things don't last Behold, this is the joy of his way, and out of the earth others will grow. Behold, God will not cast away the blameless, nor will he uphold the evildoers. 
He will yet fill your mouth with laughing, your lips with rejoicing. Those who hate you will be clothed with shame, and the dwelling place of the wicked will come to nothing. Listen, he's saying, this is how the Lord works. Remember that the end of the wicked is hard. He ultimately dies, and someone rises up and replaces him. But, verse 20, God will not cast away the blameless. God will not reject the righteous man. And God does not help the evil man do evil. If you are truly blameless, God will restore you. And God will deal with those who have hurt you. You see, the problem is Bildad thinks Job is hiding sin because Job is suffering so greatly. Years ago, a particular doctrine entered into the church and infected the church and influenced the church. It was called the prosperity doctrine. Many of you may be familiar with it. It began, its history goes back quite a ways, and I'm not going to give you a lot of information about it, but I will say a couple of things about it. Uh, originally, it was propagated by an individual named uh, Kenneth Hagin, but Kenneth Hagin had actually gotten the, the elements of this from a, a, a man who was, wasn't a Christian. His name was E.W. Kenyon. And E.W. Kenyon had uh, published something around the turn of the 20th century or so about, um, about the, the power of your words and positive thinking. And that kind of thinking kind of infiltrated into the church. And so eventually what happened is the, the power of positive thinking and the power of confessing and the power of your words that were actually originally from a, uh, a non-Christian perspective began to infiltrate the church. And a man by the name of uh, Kenneth Hagin um, took those things. I had a book that actually showed... Uh, that he actually plagiarized great portions of the writings of E.W. Kenyon. And um, he popularized this, this, this belief that if you really love the Lord, nothing bad will happen to you. And you can confess with your mouth and your words have power, and so you can actually create reality. E and uh, so E.W. Kenyon influenced the writings of Kenneth Hagin, who went on to influence the writings and thinking of a man named Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland began to influence people like Frederick Casey Price and Marilyn Hickey and quite a number of others, and they popularized a doctrine that became what is referred to as the positive confession movement. Many of you have heard of it, perhaps you haven't, which is basically saying that what you believe and what you and what you confess becomes your reality. It became almost magical so that the strength of my confession and the strength of my belief is going to actually create reality. So within this movement, there was a guarantee that they were giving based on your faith that you would never be sick because you can confess health. And so all of you are probably familiar with this. But if you don't get well, many of the proponents would say, it's because your faith wasn't strong enough and you were confessing the wrong things. Now, this entered into the church through a variety of ways, especially as it was popularized on the quote-unquote Christian television channel TBN. With TBN, you had uh, Paul Crouch and his wife who would bring these speakers on. And so, from what at one time had been a movement that, that was called a Jesus movement, where we actually wanted to read the Bible, rightly divide it, and apply it, the out, kind of the outliers of the Pentecostal movement, the Hagans and Copelands and those, began to infiltrate through TV, so it became a popularized doctrine. And it infected quite a number of churches. And in our early days here in this church, there's more than one time that I had conversations with people 
who believed that I wasn't teaching the whole council because I wasn't teaching people that they were automatically healed when they got saved. All they needed to do was confess their healing. But the problem with that is, one, it's biblically not true. You know, my words do not command God. My words do not create reality. Two, it's misunderstanding the ways of the Lord and the place of suffering and affliction in the body of Christ. Now, it's not that we wake up in the morning saying, God, could you please hurt me today? I don't wake up that way. I don't think anybody here does. But I can also say that through the times of pain and the times of hurt and the times of disappointment, I have discovered God. And I haven't always gone through times of affliction because I sinned and it was coming back and I was reaping the consequences. You see, that was part of the positive confession movement. If you're not healed, it's because you've got unconfessed sin. And what happened is people were so busy confessing every sin to make sure that they were washed and cleansed, it became a works orientation, plus they believed that they could begin to command God by their faith, and God had to honor them so that they spoke to a mountain, the mountain had to be removed, and if that mountain was not removed, then it's my lack of faith. The problem is, is some of the proponents of this particular doctrine died of diseases. Kenneth Hagin died, not of natural causes. And uh, Frederick Casey Price, who was a very big proponent, his wife had cancer. And so it, that should have proven that there was something wrong with what's being taught. But people still clung to it. Now, it isn't as strong today as it was 20 years ago, but it still has infiltrated the church. And what we're seeing, and the reason I told you all of that, is what we're seeing in these arguments are actually arguments that people who cling to the positive confession movement, it's their arguments. This is what they argue. You are sick, Job, because you have unconfessed sin. That's why. Listen, you know, when you, when you sow to the flesh, from the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. We've already been reading that. They're blaming Job for his condition. And that's what Bildad is doing. He's saying, you have sin. You have to deal with it. But we already read the first page. The first page of the book of Job, God says he's a righteous man and he hates evil. He didn't have at that time an unconfessed sin. This was something different. And this is something that God was using in the life of Job. And we'll see it at the conclusion to show Job things about himself that Job doesn't know. Remember, at the end of the, of the book, Job says, I heard of you with the hearing of my ear. But now I see you with the seeing of my eye, and I abhor myself in sackcloth and ashes. I, I walked by faith and not by sight, and I didn't have a complete understanding. But now that I've seen you, it now makes sense. We're going to see that later on. But as we're going through this, I wanted to tell you this so that next week you'll see that the line of argumentation here is constantly blaming Job. When in fact, Job at this time is saying, what have I done? God, show me what I've done. I'll turn from it. But these people are so bent on, no, Job, read the books. Look at the history. Problem is, you've done something wrong. Well, at this place, they're wrong. We'll stop here and we'll pick up next week. I wanted to give you that so you'll have an understanding as we keep going through this book.